I'm going to start my class by first showing a short video. It should be about four minutes. Uh, you should be seeing it now. I'm not sure if you're going to be hearing it. Uh, you should be able to hear it. Yes, you are seeing some miracles. Peter Popoff, W.B. Grant, and Jim Baker have all appeared on television as prophets of God seeking a donation. I need 50 people to help her with a $1,000 gift. However, all of these men have been exposed for some type of fraudulent activity. As you'll see, each of them managed to resurrect their career, continuing to do what they do best. I mean, I'm not afraid to break canes or crutches, jerk people out of wheelchairs. In 1986, Peter Popoff took in around $4 million a year as a televangelist who claimed to heal the sick. Oh, glory! During his revivals, Popoff claimed that God spoke to him directly, revealing the names and ailments of his congregants. Not everyone can hear the voice of God. He then acted accordingly to fix their problems. Oh, she got shocked! Unknown to Popoff, investigator James Randy sat in on a few of his revivals with some friends, a radio scanner, and a video camera. Randy then took what he discovered and played it on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Hello, PD. Can you hear me? If you can't, you're in trouble. Is it Popoff? Wait, was being prompted by Randy. his wife. Okay, Randy, you're in trouble. Through a wireless earpiece. 16 months after the piece was aired, Popoff filed for bankruptcy. Ten years later, he was back on the air. Coming up. His act roughly the same. She got shot! Popoff now pedals Miracle Spring Water, which he asks you to sprinkle over a check. That's to prove God with a $19 offering. Or I feel that millionaire potential is going to be released in this year of Jubilee. As of 2005, Peter Popoff's ministry was taking in $23 million a year. Like Popoff, W.P. Grant led local revivals across the nation, claiming to heal members of the audience on the spot. In the name of Jesus. Come on. In the name of Jesus. A favorite diagnosis of his? One leg shorter than the other. It's about two inches shorter than the leg on my side. Grant would bring the afflicted to the stage, seat them, then miraculously grow the leg two to three inches instantly. Thank you. Hallelujah. Mesmerized by what they'd seen, Grant would then beg his congregants to give whatever money they had. In 1996, Grant was found guilty of failing to report $375,000 in taxable income. He was sentenced to 16 months in prison. Upon his release in 1997, he restarted his ministry in Dallas, Texas, where he solicited donations via form letters, including a square of cloth in each envelope. Sackcloth piece from a robe that we uh, were asking God to bless. While Popoff and Grant parlayed their followers' donations into lavish lifestyles, it was Jim Baker who elevated the classic televangelist operation into an organization large enough to support an entire theme park. Addition to the PTL Partners Center. Jim and then wife Tammy Faye Baker built an empire through their Praise the Lord network that at one time generated an annual revenue in excess of $100 million. After church secretary Jessica Hahn came forward stating that Baker had paid her $279,000 to stay quiet about an affair, he resigned. Soon afterward, the IRS launched an investigation and convicted Baker on 24 counts of financial fraud, sentencing him to 45 years in prison. While incarcerated, Baker's wife, Tammy Faye, filed for divorce. After five years, Jim Baker was given a reduced sentence and released from prison. He restarted his ministry and in 2003 began broadcasting The Jim Baker Show. During every broadcast, an 800 number is provided at the bottom of the screen for you to make a donation. As of 2013, the IRS still had a lien against Jim Baker. That's when the jumbo gets rebuilt. Unfortunately, these men do not feed exclusively on their followers' finances. Popoff and Grant regularly call on attendees to throw their canes and medications on stage, proving for everyone they've been healed by God. I tell you, that just burns the devil up! Sadly, the criticism extends beyond the self-appointed prophets to the people who willingly give over their time, money, and influence to these operations. We've seen three examples of men who've been openly caught defrauding their congregations, only to return again with the same act. Only these days, they now accept donations via PayPal as well. Uh, what is considered this list of the 15 richest and most successful pastors in the world um, was put together years ago. It is posted as August 30th, 2020, but this list was drawn up much earlier than this. So uh, some of them have passed off the scene and some of them are worth much more than what is being posted here because, as I said, it was long before uh, this, uh, when it was posted. So we see this guy here, uh, Kenneth Copeland, uh, worth a total of $760 million. 
Uh, Bishop T.D. Jake's a favorite, $150 million, probably worth much more now. And I'm going to scroll quickly through the 15 of them because these are some of the most popular and some more are coming aboard even as we speak. Uh, definitely Joel Olstein worth more than $40 million. Uh, when we had that serious flood in Texas, uh, he was worth much more than that. Uh, Preferred dollar, another popular guy. All these are worth much more uh, since this list has been posted and the value of their organizations. So I want you to see this because I want you to have an idea of what you're dealing with. And I'm not promoting them. I'm just showing you that these individuals are all about money. We're dealing with this subject. Glitter or gold, modern worship versus truth and substance. And I asked for Acts chapter 24 to be read because we dealt with an individual in the Roman government known as Felix. And we're told that when Paul preached to him and he heard the things which Paul preached, that in verse 25, he says, Paul reasoned to him about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. None of, none of these individuals that we have shown here on the screen makes that a hallmark of their preaching. If they speak about judgment, it is only judgment when you don't pay them or contribute to their wealthy lifestyle. They don't preach about righteousness. Righteousness is subject to what you want to hear and what will get them more money out of your hand. So righteousness basically for them is subjective. They don't speak about temperance because the individuals go on to live as they are the same way that they came. So there's no temperance. There's no governing of the flesh. But the way that Paul preached it, as we read in Acts 24 verse 25, we're told that Felix trembled. So there had to be a difference between what Paul was saying, the value, the substance, the truth, the impact, the effective, effectiveness of what Paul was saying. Verse 26 tells us that he often listened to Paul and he kept Paul because he hoped that Paul would have paid him some money to release him or bribe him. And so for two years, Felix sent and called Paul and listened to him. And Paul continued to reason this message. And it would appear as those two years continue, it began to fall on dollar and dollar ears. But money was involved. Felix hoped to get money that he might release Paul. He trembled at Paul's message. So the issue of money as effective as, the, uh, uh, as being necessary for preaching God's word has not, not, has not been established because all are called to preach God's word, either by word, by leadership, or by your actions. The, 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 the premises upon which these individuals use tithing is fraudulent. It's fake. Because if you cannot go back to the Mosaic law because that was predicated upon the fact that the Levites were not given inheritance amongst their brethren, unlike the other 11 tribes. They were given territory, they were given land. All the Levites had were cities. They were not numbered as one of the 12 tribes. God says, they're working for me. I have given them to you as a gift for them to minister in the tabernacle, to do service on your behalf for me in terms of sacrifice, uh, maintaining the law, keeping the law and judgment among the people. He says, you therefore have to provide for their sustenance, saying that they do not have fields, and land and vineyards and a, and, a, and a tribe. And the whole objective of this was that the Levites were not supposed to be worrying and be caught up in the daily maintenance and material things. And they were supposed to, like a Nazarite, dedicate and devote their life to service to God and the, on the behalf uh, of the people. When we transition 
across scriptures and approaching New Testament. Even the Apostle Paul says he was not beholden to anyone, even at the Corinthians. He says, I took nothing from you so that you would not be uh, held you, you not be held back or have to be refrain have to refrain from speaking harshly to them when it was necessary. But he said he worked and labored with his two hands as a tent maker to provide for his necessary uh, uh, sustenance. All of the apostles were told in some shape or form provided their sustenance. When we uh, look at the other uh, Acts chapter two, I believe where it says they all they sold all that they had and they all had things common sort of a communal setting and they live from those proceeds one would agree that at some point those funds would be depleted and these disciples we are told had homes and had families and they had some other alternative work remember that the disciples were fishers fishermen before they came to the gospel and yes, Christ called them away from it. And yes, some of them relied on donations to continue the ministry work, the collection from those ecclesias that was more wealthy and those brethren that were more wealthy to sustain this work. But Paul made it essentially clear that preaching was not to the end that one make a living from it. He says he will not be a burden to any ecclesia or to anyone. So the Apostle Peter also says that the work of the Lord should be conducted and carried out. The ministering of the word, not for filthy lucre sake. Uh, the word lucre meaning money or finances or material things. Not for filthy lucre sake. Neither having lordship over God's heritage or the Lord's heritage, his flock. So when we look at these individuals who are living in mansions, flying jets, buying expensive cars, all things over and beyond what is necessary to preach and spread God's word. It begs the question, what is the motive? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 to 20, we are told, the words of Jesus, a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee, whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. In other words, Jesus is saying, Don't come and join me expecting any material gain. Be aware of what you are joining. This is a life of sacrifice. This is a life of contrition. This is a, a, a life where wealth is measured and your spiritual growth and value. This is a life that is me me measured in how much you are capable and willing to sacrifice in the service of God and not how much materialism you are able to get out of it. Titus chapter 1 and verse 11 tells us, Whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, each one of those televangelists and these uh, uh, grandstanding preachers of the day indeed subvert houses, corrupt houses, corrupt minds. They're teaching things which they are not because God is not going to punish anyone if they give him money, if they don't give him money. There's no one-tenth mandate upon the ecclesia or the house of God under the law of grace. Paul says, how much you can afford, as much as the Lord has blessed you, and you see it fit, give something. He put no, he stipulated no amount. As the Lord has blessed you, donate what you see fit and what you can afford. It is therefore left to the heart of the individual, his conscience, to donate what he can. If he can do one-tenth, give it. If you can give more than one-tenth, give it. If you can only afford less than one-tenth, give it. That is acceptable. If you can't give monetary value and you can give physical work and contribution to the Lord's service, that is of great price also.
But Titus says, the, the Paul to Titus says, there are individuals who are going around teaching things and measuring their teaching by how much financial gain they can make from it. We quoted Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. We are told to feed the flock of God with spiritual food, godly nutriment, which is among you. Taking oversight, therefore, not by constraint or not having to be forced to do it, but willingly and not for, again, filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now, the title, Glitter, or gold it is a saying that all that scintillate is not auriferous, and those are big words that means that all that glitter is not gold, all that scintillate is not auriferous, or all that glitter is not gold. The wages of sin are glittering. It seems as though when you get involved in a mystery in, in a ministry preaching God's word, that it becomes lucrative. It become an easy source of wealth because it is not taxable. It's tax exempted. Your purchases, your way of life are exempted from taxation. So it becomes a tax haven to these crooks. But it's not auriferous. And gold stands for faith. It stands for value. The wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Paul, Apostle Peter again will say that they were bringing damnable heresies as we saw some of them were doing there, pretending that they're healing people and have the capacity to heal people. When that don't work, they promise you death and damnation and an eternal burning hell to scare you out of your wits to serve the true and living God. God has sent us on a mission of fear, mongering to get people to serve him. He sent us on a mission of speaking the truth, preaching his word, Depicting his coming kingdom in vivid terms and seriousness that men may wish to embrace it and love and want to embrace it. He wants us to preach of his son, that he was a man like you and I who lived upon this earth for three and a half, sorry, who ministered upon this earth for three and a half years and lived upon this earth for between 33 and 34 years, who died on the cross, who literally died, who was who came in the flesh was killed on the cross, buried in a tomb, resurrected on the third day, met with his disciples for 40 days, and then ascended to the right hand of his father. That is the Jesus that our father in heaven wants us to talk about. Not a Trinitarian body of Christ, God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not a doctrine that the Catholics bring forbidden to marry. Not a doctrine for uh, talking about purgatory. Where your, where your your relatives are languishing somewhere between midway between hell and heaven, and you have to pay a huge amount of money to get them out of purgatory. Not all these false doctrines. This is nonsense. But Peter was saying, Second Peter chapter two and verse one. But there were false prophets also among the people, and they have always been. And there will always be. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. Who privily or secretly. Shall bring in damnable heresies. Even denying the Lord that brought them. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, these individuals that we saw paraded early on the screen. Uh, behave as though they are the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Pope behave. The hope. The Pope says he's Christ's vicar on earth. He speaks on the behalf of God that he put forth infallible bulls or encyclials yearly. And that there he can change God's word. He can introduce new laws and make of no effect laws of God that it rests upon him to declare what is right and wrong. This is the world of religion that we are dealing with today. Heretics denying that Jesus is the Christ, denying that God will send his son back to this earth to set up a kingdom upon this earth, denying that God created this earth to be inhabited and that he's going to destroy and take everybody up into heaven, 
nowhere does the scripture supp uh, uh, supports that. Zechariah tells us, tells us that there will be boys and girls playing in the streets of Jerusalem. Revelation tells us that there will be the, the, the streets of Jerusalem and the constitution of the Jerusalem will be established upon this earth that Jesus will return from the heavens. We are told that in Thessalonians that he should come with a great shout of the archangel. Isaiah tells us in chapter 11 that the, 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 the character of our Lord and his constitution and how he will judge the earth and the meek not with the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his, earth, or of his ears, but with righteousness. We are told in Isaiah chapter 2 that all nations shall say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And there he will teach us of his laws and we we'll hear of his ways. These are the values that the Lord God teach and ask us to preach. Not the nonsense and the gibberish we are hearing today, all scintillating nonsense. But when we look at the second point we're about to make here, we hear about Antichrist. Uh, and it, the, the word Antichrist is only used in scriptures, uh, I believe, four times. Antichrist, yet it took on a whole new heretic spin that somehow Antichrist is associated with some common individual, some one individual that's going to be uh, fighting against Christ. Uh, and running this earth and trying to subjugate people. When the word of God tells us in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. So each one of us, any person that deny that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the King, is the Antichrist already? It's not no one individual. It's a, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of understanding scripture. It's a doctrine that you embrace and that you believe that makes you an Antichrist, an opposition to Christ. If you don't believe that Jesus is the king, then you believe someone else is. Either some man on earth or some other false religion. So a denial that Jesus is king but the word Christ means Messiah. To deny that Jesus is the king makes you an antichrist. You are opposed and in opposition to the Christ. If you deny God is the true God and that Jesus is his son, you are considered on the scriptural terms an antichrist. Look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh it's not of God. So the Trinitarian doctrine and its values, what it teaches and stands for, makes a number of people antichrist because they do not teach under the Trinitarian doctrine that Jesus is come in the flesh. They do not teach that. They somehow say that he was semi-divine. He had this uh, a pure flesh doctrine and teaching. He could not sin. It's as though he became immortal. Then how did he die on the cross? How are we told that Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered? How could Jesus be immortal and divine when he was upon this earth? And yet felt faint by the well of Sychar and begged a woman to give him some water. How could he experience human suffering and need and want? How could he bleed? How could he die on a cross if he was immortal and divine, of divine, divine nature when he was upon this earth? We are told that he was born of the Virgin Mary, a child, flesh and blood. We are told that after he was resurrected and they saw the Christ, his disciples hung back in fear and thought that they saw a spirit. And what did Jesus say to them? He says, He's not a spirit. A spirit have not flesh and blood, as you see that flesh and, and bones. A spirit has not flesh and bones, he says. So now he was resurrected. His nature was of such flesh and bones, absence of blood. Blood is the life force of mortal men. In the kingdom age, blood will not be the life force of the saints and the immortalized, the immortalized saints. 
to be the spirit and power of God as it should be and as it will be. So when one deny the nature of Christ and try to impute a different nature, they are ascribed as being antichrist. We continue in 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming, the spirit is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So when John penned these words, 2,000 years ago, he said that the spirit or the teaching or the doctrine or people that shared the nature and the thought process of the Antichrist were already in existence. So how come others are teaching that we are with this Antichrist that is yet to be developed or that is some one person? When the Apostle John says that there were already Antichrists in existence 2,000 years ago who did not believe that Jesus came in the flesh, that Jesus was the Son of God. He says in verse chapter, in 2 John chapter 1 continues again. The third of these four, the, uh, the third of four references to Antichrist, uh, only four references in scripture. 2 John chapter 1, verse 7 tells us, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and Antichrist. And John says that they were already in the world. They say that they were coming to uh, some, some perspective. Uh, development down the road. He says they already existed. There were already those who denied the re resurrection. There were those who denied that Jesus was the Christ. Judas being one of those. And then third, we deal with those sect of people who are now terming themselves as the non-denominationers. No affiliation. They go under the guise that they worship under no denomination, no title, no name, no loyalty to any particular body. I got, I have news for the individuals who want to free themselves from the halls or from the unifying body of Christ, who don't want to be associated with a particular body, that God is not worshipped under the system or the mindset that all religions lead to God. It was a saying back home in Barbados that all roads lead to Bridgetown. And so it did. Because it was a pivotal or central point, the center of how we got to and from um, public transportation around Barbados. The bus, when, we, when you got on a public transport in Barbados, it either was going away from Bridgetown or to Bridgetown. So all roads in Barbados uh, lead to Bridgetown. But all religions don't lead to God. When we look at 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, Elijah says unto the people, How long haul ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Now, if all gods And all forms of religions dovetails into the one and true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. What is Elijah saying? How, how, why are you between two opinions? Make a choice. It can't be Muhammad, Buddha, uh, all, all of these other different religions and denominations. It, they, they, they're not all leading to our heavenly father. To the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. And yet we have a world that says they don't have to be committed to any particular religion. They don't necessarily even have to read the Bible. Once they live a God-fearing and godly life, once they live a righteous love life, once they live a life where they respect their neighbor and do good deeds in society, somehow they will see some glorious and happy ending. That is not what the word of God teach. If you go to Acts chapter 10, we are told clearly that there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, who did all of that. And yet God sent an angel to him and says, that is not enough. Except you be baptized in your household. 
you're going to perish. All the arms given and building of synagogues and all the kind deeds you did to the, to, to the Jews and all the praying daily, three times a day. Would all be wasted if Cornelius wasn't baptized. So you have to come into the body of Christ. And the reason that Christ created one body, him being the head, is that so we may live in unity and understand the need, the need of unity because it will be the spirit of what the kingdom age is about. Not a fragmentation of several different sects and religions. There's only one Bible. There's only one Christ. There's only one Lord. And there's only one God. And there's only one way, the true and narrow way, the straight and narrow way. Broad is a way that leads to destruction and many be there and many there be that find it. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 tells us that we be henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sly of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So there's many doctrines and religions out there that teach forms of godliness and forms of righteousness and forms of self-servient and self-appraising righteousness and, and good deeds and good acts. But unless we comply to the way to salvation and life that is laid out in God's word, there's no hope, my friend. There's no hope, young people. The question is, and always has been from Garden of Eden, who was wronged, man or God? Whose law was violated, man's law or God's law? Who created a breach? Man, man wronged God, man disobeyed God, man broke God's law. God was the one offended. God was the one who suffered unjust behavior on the part of man. So the victimizer, the criminal, does not get to set the terms or conditions of redress for the victim. The victim gets to set the terms or condition of peace and redress for what he has been wronged. The criminal don't get that right. So where does man come off saying, I'm going to set the terms of my return to God and my healing of this breach? We have to follow God's, God's rules and his laws. Jesus says that seven man be born again. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. The apostle Paul lays out a, a, a series of behavior that if we indulge in them, we cannot see the kingdom of God. And so another group, the non-denominationers are seeking to have a jolly good time of glitz and blitz and glitter and are following because there are different denominations that have sprung up to attend to the different needs of individuals of what they want to hear and how they want to live and not what God ascribed for us to do in order that we may have salvation and eternal life. Then there's a fourth group who are entertainment seekers as we just saw there in the video. Entertainment and amusement seekers. They, they, these are the individuals who seek preachers and teachers who tintillate their ears who entertain them and make them jump up and roll on the floor and backflip and shout hallelujah over and over. And there's no messaging. There's no need or call to change one's life. It is come as you are, remain as you are. That is the group that seeks entertainment and amusement. And hear the words of Isaiah chapter 30, verse 19, 11. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of God. We say to the seers or the teachers or the prophets or the ministers of God's word, we say to them, see not and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. This is Isaiah 30 verse 9, 11. Prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Do you hear the words political, political correctness there? Do you hear the words don't hurt? My feelings speak unto us smooth things, politically correct things. 
and prophesy deceit. These televangelists and these preachers, they're following that script. They know what the people want and what they're asking, and they're giving it to them. Verse 11 of Isaiah 30 goes on. Get out of the way, they say. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from a mosque. Isn't that what the world religious system is saying? The ecclesiastical world is saying? Don't bring God in here. I don't want to hear about God. Tell me how good I am. Tell me what I can do. Bless what I have do, what I'm doing. Accept the sexual proclivities that I indulge in. Accept all the lifestyles that I have that are at odds with God. That is what they're saying. Take God out of the equation. Don't talk about him. Talk about me. The entertainment and the amusement seekers. Ezekiel 33 verse 30 to 32 tells us, Also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come. I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord, so they say. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Verse 32, and lo, Thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. This is the congregation. The masses that we see out there in the ecclesiastical world. They come in, they jump up and they clap and they applause and hallelujah and praise the Lord and they do I mean, not deriding people's form of worship. We're just quoting scriptures. He says that it is as a, 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 a melodious voice, like a lovely sound they hear. And that is how these televangelist songs in the ear. They're not giving them substance. They're not telling them that they have to change. That the man who comes to God has to renounce his former way of life, crucify the flesh. Romans chapter 6. They're not being told this. They're being promised heaven going. They're being promised things that is not in God's word. I hope they can deliver at the day of judgment what they have promised the people because God certainly is not promising some of the things they're promising. And they're coming, their crowds, they call others and they bring them in mass. And some of our young ones and our followers are gravitating towards that form of religion. They find it interesting and entertaining. But while I was preparing for this talk, it dawned on me that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he ministered upon this earth, was not about numbers. His ministry was not about how many people he can get. And indeed, there were thousands at times around him, crowds, thousands. The Lord Jesus Christ was about substance. The people says never before taught a man like this, for he spoke with authority and truth. He rejected the philosophies of the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. He says that their teachings were destructive, committing more bodies and men to hell than calling people forth out of darkness into light. There's a group who gravitate towards the glitter and the false religion and the smooth things and the soft teachings and shy away from sound doctrine. We spoke earlier about the academic side of the word of God. And there is an academic side and there's a need for academic side. You must be able to read properly and carefully and dissect and research God's word. That's the academic aspect. But then when we find those nuggets of truth, when we find those godly principles, we now have to both live them and teach them. But there are, there, there, there are another group of people who find that hard and who furthermore find another hardness in that when these principles are found and delivered, find them too hard to embrace. 
And we see this in John chapter 6, verse 59 to 60. And verse 65 to 69. These things said he, that is Jesus, in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Here Jesus is teaching about his death, his pending death and resurrection, the need to partake of his body, the need to drink his blood, the need to understand what his father required of them, the need to accept him as first the savior, the lamb of the world, the lamb from the foundation of the world that his father has sent to die for the sins of men. They first have to embrace that side and that aspect and that mission of his. And then they have to embrace that he will come again as Messiah, as king, to set up a new kingdom upon this earth. And that there will be a transitionary or waiting period, a period of probation. And all of this, they said, is too hard. We can't take it. We'd rather continue fighting the Roman government. So they went on. They said, this is a hard saying who can hear it. Verse 65 of John chapter 6. And he said, Jesus, that is Jesus, therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. And listen to verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him because they found the doctrines and the teachings too hard. And if they left Jesus and walked no more with him, what, my friend, what? My young people, what my brethren did, they went back to. They went back to the clergy. They went back to the glitter and the sparkles, the substanceless teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the high priests and chief priests. That is what they went back to. That is what they went back and embraced. And then you hear the words of Jesus in verse 67. And these words, that Jesus says, every time I read them, I don't think they are read with the impact and the tone of voice that at times they should be read. Imagine seeing Jesus pulling together, slowly a, a group is building around him, attentive to his words, starting to change and transition from the old way of life. And then as he becomes deeper and deeper and more explanatory into the, the gospel message, the way of life that they're supposed to live, bringing them closer to his pending death and what they will have to endure. They found it too hard and walk away from him. And then Jesus was saying, verse 67 of John chapter 6, then said Jesus unto the 12, will he also go away? He's not telling them to go away. He's asking them almost in a pleading voice, a broken spirit, a broken heart. A saddened heart. Will he also leave me? It is as if the whole ecclesia of Christ had fallen apart. So it went from suddenly from hundreds to back down to the 12 that he had called. But then Simon Peter gave the right answer. Even though he himself has not been fully converted. Verse 68 to 69. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou and thou alone has the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And so young people, my brother and my friends, if you indeed believe that Christ is the son of the living God and that he's the Messiah and that he will return again, and you believe the first principles and the fundamental teachings of the brotherhood of the Christadelphian. It behoves you to ask the question and make the statements of the apostle Peter. To whom shall you go? To these false prophets? Back to what you were called from? To these shysters who are teaching for money what men want to hear? If you know that the brotherhood of the Christadelphian has the words of truth and eternal life and we are studious studiers of the word of God and our messaging is according to the first 
century apostolic teachings. Even though at times we may not always be able to live up to what we teach, we aspire and try to live out the things that we know and we teach. But we are human beings. At times we fail. None, none of us shall hold that against any of us. There's a saying that goes, and I heard this from when I was a, a young man in Barbados. There is some bad in all of us. There's some bad in all of us. And there's some good in all of us. And therefore, it does not behoove any of us to speak bad of the rest of us. I'll say that again. There's some bad in all of us. And there's some good in all of us. Therefore, it does not behoove the rest of us to speak bad or evil of the rest of us. And when we understand those words, I don't know who said them. It then asks why we run out of the house of God because we expect perfection. I think it was Harry Tennant who brought out this message and he says, he says, if the apostles with the comforter the gift of the Holy Spirit power, which they had the authority and the power to lay up and give pass on to others, whom the others that they pass it on to could not pass on to others, therefore it ceased after a time. But here's the apostle Peter, James, John, all the other, and Matthias was added after the decease of uh, Judas. These 12 apostles, given the comforter, the angel from the presence of God, exceptional Holy Spirit power, and you know what, young people? They themselves could not produce the perfect ecclesia. And they had the Holy Spirit power. They had the assistance of the angels of the presence of the Lord, who was called the comforter. And they could not produce the perfect ecclesia. How much so do you think you and I can produce one? Are you still looking for the perfect ecclesia? Or are you looking for an ecclesia in the making? When Christ returns, shall make it perfect. And so we, in every ecclesia that you find yourself in, with all its defects, with all its shortcomings, I find to be much more sound in doctrine and practice. You know, all the shysters I see running around there, preaching false doctrines and heresies and what men want to hear. You then have verse six. Sorry, point number six. The I do not know what I am looking for group. The I do not know what I am looking for group. This we read in Matthew chapter 11, verse 7 to 10. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Ye I say unto you, I'm more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thy way before thee. So there are those who out there don't know what they're looking for. They just turn into any shop, any hall, any building, any congregation. And they have no clue of what they're looking for. And so they become gullible to fall for anything. We have to know what we are looking for, young people. If we are looking for truth, if we are looking for sound doctrine that teaches us that Christ will return upon this earth, that we need to transform our lives, and not conform it to this world. If we need, if we are looking for a doctrine that teaches God's principles and God's word, I believe you have found it. Then you have the seventh group, the belly full group, the group I call the belly full group. John 6, verse 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, 
but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him have God the Father sealed. They said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him who have sent you. And this is what we teach. We teach the first principle doctrine. We study the scriptures at the Berean to see whether these things be true. We jostle principles and ideas. We make sure that what principles we come up with and what doctrine we come up with, it holds true from Genesis to Revelation, that it follows the theme to Revelation, to Revelation. We follow biblical principles that teach of the suffering Lord and the resurrected Lord and the returning Lord to this earth as king and judge and Messiah. We teach that the whole scriptures, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O Lord. That is what we teach. That is what we should believe. When we take up the word of God, we should know that from front cover to back cover, it is about the Lord Jesus Christ reflecting the character of his father, doing the will of his father, and about nothing else. And that the objective of God's word is to fill this earth with the knowledge of his glory as the waters cover the sea. And he has given us copious examples of those who have succeeded faithfully in propagating and putting forward that doctrine and that uh, ministry. And he has given us copious examples of judgments of those who fought against this truth or those who relinquished this truth and suffered damnation and judgment. Romans chapter 16, verse 18 tells us the sad words of, for they are such, for they that are such serve not their Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of many. Such are those that so many gravitate to. These are the teachers who give them what they want and not what they need. They are of the types of the Aaron, who when the people assail him after Moses delaying the mount in the presence of God, they said, we want not about this Moses. We've been here 40 days. We haven't seen him. Up and let us make gods that we might worship them. And it goes to Aaron. And instead of Aaron, chastise them and keep them in check. Him being of the, the high priest. What did Aaron do? He says, give me all your earrings. Give me your gold and, 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 and let me make a God for you. And he says, he threw it in the fire. Out came a car. But he was a miracle worker, I guess. So Aaron, instead of chastising the people and keeping them in check, teaching them some values, reminding them that they were called out of Egypt from these gods, he gave them what they want. And Moses was wrath with them and God also. We understand later that God was so wrath with Aaron that he, if it was not the intercession of Moses and the atonement of Moses for him, God was going to kill him. And that is going to be the end result of all these false prophets who mislead the people. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse, 20, verse 24, we see another ideology of give them what they want and not what they need. Saul was sent on a mission to annihilate the Amalekites. And we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, that he reneged from his duties and his responsibility. Why? And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Too often we preach a doctrine and a gospel message because we fear that people will leave or people will be upset by the words are said and how they are said. That should not deter us. Speak the truth. Speak some doctrine, says the Apostle Paul. Uh, before the notes, uh, I see I'm already at 1130, very end. So I'm going to conclude on where this apostate and apostasy of teachings uh, ends with two passages. Those who would find the smooth, politically correct words of the modern day preachers 
sounding sweetly in their ears, as the apostle told Timothy, they will not endure sound doctrine. In in uh, Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter four, they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heed to themselves teachers who teach them what they want to hear. I want you to understand that this will lead to what Paul, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwards, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. And so this congregation of, this huge congregation of men and women, who are listening to these modern day Pharisees and scribes. These hypocrites who live one way and teach another. And live off the people. They are collecting a collection of dead men bones and all uncleanness. And this is summed up it, where it begins from Cain. With his apostate behavior of doing what he feels. And a religion that, he, that please him and not God. Where it began in Genesis. We are told in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2 to 4, where it ends because we have a great apostasy taking place in our world today. And hear this. And he cried mightily, Revelation chapter 18, verse 2 to 4. He cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. It has become the habitation of devils and the hole of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through her abundance uh, for delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out from among her, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive none of her plagues. And I trust, young people, that the ending of this camp, that you can understand and be more hard pressed of why you have to come out of the world and come out of these false doctrines for their, their false doctrine has become the habitation of every false spirit and every false doctrine and religion and amalgamation of paganism and witchcraft, estrianism and all forms of different doctrines you can find under Catholicism and under modern, uh, uh, modern Protestant church. They're not teaching any one straight doctrine. When you examine their doctrine, it's an amalgamation of several different foreign doctrines that they teach as one. And their doctrine has become the habitation of everything that's, um, that's not biblical, not first century apostolic teaching, and is corrupt and will lead to ultimate destruction. Let us indeed come out from among them and let us return and, 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 and stick to sound doctrine and sound practices. Thank you.